Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We take up the words of Jesus' parable, really, uh, in the middle section of our text today from Mark's Gospel. This teaching is one of those few episodes of teaching in, in Mark's Gospel. It's one of those Gospels of action where Mark is always taking us into something else that Jesus is doing, but only to emphasize what he's teaching. What we're dwelling on here today has taken place early in Jesus' ministry. He's been going out proclaiming the gospel of God to repent and believe in the good news. And miraculous signs have accompanied his teaching, including, as we find throughout Mark's gospel, the casting out of evil spirits, the casting out of demons, those angels of darkness. And the news about him has traveled, and he's, well, a popular guy. So much so that Mark says that as they gather at his home that evening, they couldn't even find time to eat. But with popularity comes criticism. The religious authorities have sent the scribes some representatives to keep an eye on Jesus to see if he was going to be a problem see if what he is teaching is right according to God's Word. And it doesn't take long for envy, for jealousy to rear its ugly head. We heard about that in our text today. Scribes came down from Jerusalem and because of this envy they began to say, he is possessed by Beelzebul. It's a fancy name for, for the devil, for Satan. And by the prince of demons, he casts out demons. The miracles of Jesus are so public and so well known that even his enemies can't deny them. But instead, they try to discredit them. They accuse Jesus of working his miracles in league with the demons. They are literally saying that because Jesus is able to cast out demons, he must himself be demon-possessed. But their accusations don't make any sense. Demons may be pure evil, but they aren't stupid either. Why would they fight against themselves by driving themselves out of people? And so Jesus says as much. When he calls the people to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And he goes on, if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but is coming to an end. Jesus went on to teach what it means to truly defeat Satan. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, Jesus says. Then indeed he may plunder his house. In this teaching, Jesus is acknowledging that Satan is indeed very strong, a formidable foe, one that we should not ever take lightly. Only one stronger than Satan can plunder his household and rescue those held captive by him and his demons. And that stronger man is Jesus. The plundering of Satan's stronghold is important to each and every one of us, indeed to every soul in the whole planet. For as we say in the rite of holy baptism, the Word of God teaches us that we are all conceived and born sinful and are under the power of the devil until Christ claims us as his own. We would be lost forever unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. The Father of all mercy and grace has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who atoned for the sin of the whole world, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Thus far, our baptismal rite. Jesus teaches us that He is that stronger man who binds Satan and delivers us by grace through faith from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But how is it as our right says, 
that we are already under God's condemnation even at conception, even before we take our first breaths. The Scriptures call us condemned. That doesn't seem fair. How can a loving God do such horrible judgment? Well, the answer to that condemnation piece comes to us from the words of our Old Testament text where we heard about the results of Adam and Eve's sin. Satan, taken on the form of a serpent and had pulled a one-two punch, if you will. In his temptation, he made sin look pleasurable, made it look good, and deceived Adam and Eve. After the sin, he laid on the burden then of guilt and shame. Adam and Eve now saw God very differently than when they had, as he, they had walked with him in the cool of the day, in perfect fellowship, in perfect communion, now lost. Before he had been their loving creator, now they are ashamed because he is the terrifying judge. Adam and Eve had not merely cursed themselves with their sin, but they had cursed all their descendants and even all of creation with sin. Nevertheless, even as God announced the result of sin on the serpent, He also announces the first hope of salvation. Genesis 3.15 I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. With these words, God promised a Savior, the stronger man who would come to bind Satan and free us from the captivity that sin has on us. Jesus is that promised offspring of the woman who bruised the serpent's head. The words of judgment on the devil in Genesis are a picture of the victory that Jesus will have over him. And they're also a picture of the price that Jesus will pay in order to gain that victory. The bruised head, the bruised heel become fulfilled in Jesus on his cross. At first it seemed that Satan had the victory. When Jesus died, it appeared that the tempter, that Satan had delivered a head-crushing blow of that precious offspring. But when Jesus rose from the dead, it showed that he, he is the one who came to bruise and not just, you know, bumping your head, but a smashing blow to crush the serpent's head. And now Jesus plunders Satan's stronghold in order to carry off into safety those who were his in the first place, those whom he created, those whom he loved so much that he died on the cross for them. Sin brought death into this world. And through this world is the pathway to eternal death. But Jesus has entered this world in order to enlighten and enliven our hearts, our minds, our bodies, soul, and spirit to follow him as, as the path to eternal life. He restores those who are his. But sadly, there are those who are slaves in the house of Satan who do not want to leave. They reject Jesus' offer of forgiveness, of eternal freedom, when Jesus binds Satan and offers to carry them to safety and freedom, they are maybe like some of Mrs. M's preschoolers. Cross their hands and they just say no. <laughs> but that never happened to you, right? No. It is our stubborn pride, our stubborn will that says, I don't want a free gift. I don't want that. Sometimes we say those things in ignorance. 
Sometimes it is that awful, corrupted heart that we have that demands it my way and not God's way. For reasons we cannot understand, they reject the work of the Holy Spirit. They reject the forgiveness that Jesus offers to them freely. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says, all sins will be forgiven the children of man in whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. These are dark, scary words that honestly drive a lot of people away from the church. How can a loving God do such terrible work? But we fail to recognize that Jesus has earned forgiveness and eternal life for everyone. He sends forth his Holy Spirit to work faith in people, to deliver that forgiveness, to throw the lifeline into the depths of hell and pull out one soul at a time. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit says, I don't want that lifeline. It rejects the gift of faith and the gift of forgiveness. Sometimes by flat-out denial, I don't want God, I don't believe in Jesus. But I fear more often by letting their faith get weak and eventually die because they have failed to come where the Holy Spirit will enliven and strengthen faith through word and sacrament. People are asking the wrong question when they ask, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? It's the wrong question. Actually, that's the same attitude that Adam had when God first confronted him and Eve in the garden. What was Adam's response? That woman, that woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit and I ate. God, this is your fault. No, it's not. But it is God's justice that has to be carried out or he is not a holy and precious God. So the right question to ask is why would anyone reject the gift of love, the gift of life, the gift of forgiveness that God wants all people to have. The Bible doesn't tell us why people reject God's love, why some reject his forgiveness, why some people choose death when the Holy Spirit wants to give them life, eternal life and life in abundance. Such is the choice that believers must must make each and every day the choice to listen and love and obey God and live or do I choose to ignore him perhaps lose my faith and die ignore the Holy Spirit long enough and you will commit that unforgivable sin but if you fear that sin then the Holy Spirit has not forsaken you the Holy Spirit is alive and well with you to point you to Jesus, your life and your salvation. When Jesus suffered and died on the cross, he paid for the price of our sins, of the blasphemies, if you will, against God's will. And he has bound Satan. Now he plunders Satan's stronghold in order to set free all who are enslaved to sin. We who were conceived in sin before we even took our first breath, by God's grace, he sends the Holy Spirit to work faith to receive the forgiveness of sins and to know nothing for our salvation other than Christ Jesus and him crucified. Jesus is the stronger man, and he is victorious. We are redeemed you are forgiven. Go in peace.
Amen.